Okay, here's how Miro works. See, it's amazing. What's everyone doing at David's desk? Ever since marketing started using Miro's collaborative online whiteboard, he thinks all our other teams should sign up. Why? He says Miro's making his meetings disappear. And if every team gets on it, that means even less meetings. They're using Miro for brainstorms, mind maps, customer research. So could we use Miro instead of having another hundred meetings for every round of feedback? Yep. You can comment, react to ideas, even leave a recording on the board. And what about presentations? There are Miro templates for that. How do you know so much about Miro? I've actually been using it all along. I just used a Miro board to plan the best vacation. Okay, I'm on board. See how Miro users save up to 80 hours every year by meeting less and doing more. Get on board at Miro.com with three boards free forever. That's M I R O.com. Hello, and thank you for listening to The History of World War II Podcast, Episode 237 The Thin Gray Line, the U.S. Pacific Submarine Fleet after Pearl Harbor. After the second Japanese airstrike left Pearl Harbor, five of the eight battleships were sinking, sunk, or heavily damaged. In all, 21 ships were now below the waves. Furthermore, some 188 aircraft were destroyed, with another 159 damaged. Thus was the American Pacific Surface Fleet and Air Arm crippled. That left the defense of the U.S.'s Pacific position up to the submarine fleet, a thin gray line indeed. And coming back to the show is Flint Whitlock to discuss his and Ron Smith's book, The Depths of Courage, American Submariners at War with Japan, 1941 to 1945. So, Mr. Whitlock, thank you once again for coming back on the show. Uh, my pleasure, Ray. Thank you for having me. Absolutely. So when we talked about your your latest book, Desperate Valor, Triumph at en- Enzio, um, I searched through your library to see what other books you had written, because I enjoyed that one so much. And I was very excited to come across the one that we're going to talk about today, which is basically the submarine warfare in the Pacific. Because since I'm at this point in um, the, the timeline, I'm at uh, Pearl Harbor, I was very excited to find that your book pretty much covers what I was looking for. What, oh, what were the Americans going to do with their surface fleet and air arm so crippled after Pearl Harbor? Um, so if you could tell us a little bit about your, the book is called The Depths of Courage, American Submariners at War with Japan, 1941 to 1945. Uh, how did that book come about? Well, it was uh, kind of interesting. As a, an author, uh, I'm always looking around for new subjects to to write about, things that haven't already been written you know, to death mm-hmm. or um, taking a familiar topic and, um, and either turning it on its head, as I did with uh, Desperate Valor, or um, digging into some details that... Uh, are not well known or have been forgotten since the war mm. was over. And, and primarily I'm a, an author, historian specializing in the European theater. And uh, within you know that uh, subgenre, um, talking about mostly the, the infantry and the airborne. But um, I can't remember exactly how it came about, but back in 2003, I came across a submariner here in Denver, and by the way, it's submariner, not ah, submariner. Thank you. They they get uh, <laughs> they get upset if you call them submariners, <laughs> but at any rate, um, I, I met this uh, veteran in Denver here named uh, Clay Decker, and uh, he told a very fascinating story about his time in uh, the submarine f- service in World War II, including the fact that he was one of uh, six survivors of um, his submarine, the Tang, Mm. that basically killed itself with its own malfunctioning torpedo. And so I thought, wow, this is a really interesting story. And so I I started uh, 
interviewing him at, at his home, and we went for several hours. And afterwards I said, okay, I've got this great story. What do I do with it now? I don't think I can develop a whole book on just Clay Decker's tales, but um, maybe there's a larger picture here. And so I did a little research, and I contacted an organization called the um, uh, U.S. Submarine Veterans of World War II. And uh, I said, I'm interested in, in doing a book. Uh, are there other submariners who are part of your organization that you would recommend that I interview? And they said, well, as a matter of fact, there's a submariner uh, in Texas named Ron Smith, who uh, self-published his memoirs, and, and the memoirs are pretty good, so you might want to talk to him. Mm. So uh, they gave me uh, Ron Smith's uh, contact information, and I reached out to him and, and told him what I wanted to do, and he said, well, I'm very excited to, about that. And I said, well, what I'd really like to do is, you know, if you would send me a copy of your book, I could look it over and, you know, see where we go from there. And uh, so he did, and I and I read his uh, memoirs, which is uh, titled Torpedo Man. And um, I came away from it feeling like, wow, this guy really has uh, the personal story of, of what he went through, mm -hmm. and, and maybe I can um, make him the first part of the book and and Clay Decker the, the second half of the book because... Uh, Ron Smith went on on submarine duty um, near the beginning, and and uh, Clay Decker, and then and then uh, got out of uh, submarine active duty, mm -hmm. sea duty uh, because of PTSD, and was assigned shore duty. And this was happening about the same time that Clay Decker came on board uh, the submarine. So I thought that well, they would make perfect bookends, and all I have to do is fill in the stuff in between. Right. Um, and and I felt it was important not to to just uh, talk about the submarines, but put them in the context of the the wider war going on in the Pacific, uh, the the sea battles, the mm. island invasions, and and all of the other things that um, would really help the reader understand why the submarines were important and uh, the challenges that they faced and and things of that sort. So after. A a couple of years of, of interviewing veterans, uh, going to places like San Francisco where the USS Pampanito submarine is tied up and is open for tours, uh, uh, and uh, going to places like the uh, U.S. Navy Historical Center in Washington, D.C., mm -hmm. uh, and just interviewing uh, veterans uh, at the Submariners Convention in Orlando, Florida, in uh, 2005, I started to, to get the raw material for the book and then uh, started to, to put it together. And I asked Ron if, if uh, he'd be okay with me listing him as a co-author, and he said he, he was fine with that. Mm -hmm. And the book was published in 2007, but it's still available uh, at Amazon and from the publisher Berkeley Caliber Press which is a division of Penguin Books. So um, it, it, was, it was one of the, the most fun things, I guess you could say, right. uh, in terms of, of uh, putting together a story that hadn't been told quite the way that I decided to tell it and uh, got a lot of positive reaction from it. Uh, and uh, I've just been very proud of... of this book, which I think out of my 13 books was like uh, number five or six uh, uh, that I had, had written. And uh, so I, I'm you know, very anxious to talk to you about this because of the, the fact that um, the submarines were pretty much overlooked uh, and have been since World War II, but uh, they played such a vital role, especially... Uh, at the beginning of the war, and uh, so that's. I'm glad you wanted to 
to uh, talk about that book today. Absolutely, because yeah, when I found your book, and and I think you're right about this not being covered enough. Because when I found your book, um, I would have to say that my weak spot is the Pacific Theater, but certainly, like you said, a subset of that are are the submariners. And thank you for correcting my pronunciation on that. So <laughs> so let's start with the um with the quote from. Admiral Chester Nimitz, Commander-in-Chief, U.S. Navy Pacific Fleet, about his quote that is hopefully not forgotten, but I get a, I get a sense that maybe it has, it has faded uh, as time has gone by. He said, mm-hmm. he said, during the dark early months of World War II, it was only the tiny American force that held off the Japanese Empire and enabled our fleets to replace our losses and repair our wounds. The spirit and courage of the submarine force shall never be forgotten. Uh, could you could you expand on that a little bit? Do you think it's been forgotten over time? And and was he was he exaggerating in this hmm. quote? Yeah, I I, I think uh, it was maybe inevitable that uh, over the past seventy plus years since World War II. Um, Many branches of the service, uh, not only the Navy, but Army, um, Air Force, and Marines, many of the uh, incredible deeds that they performed have been forgotten. You know, right now, uh, if you ask probably any high school kid if he has any knowledge of um, World War II, he he might talk about uh, Pearl Harbor Mm -hmm. Uh, maybe D-Day in Normandy and uh, maybe the atomic bombs, uh, but all the other details uh, that took place during the United States uh, four years of involvement in World War II have pretty much been forgotten. And that, that's one of the you know good things about being a historian because you've always got fresh material to dredge up after 60, 70 years right. and present it as something new. Right. Because there's always an audience out there who said, well, gee, I didn't know that. So um, you know, that, that's one of the things that, that we historians um, uh, you know, use in our favor. Uh, but the submarines, um, so little is known about them, main, mainly because they were, you know, at, at, you know, at, at first a very small force, um, there were only three or four thousand men, I think, who were a part of of that force. We only had uh, by the end of the war um, 252 submarines that had taken part in the war, and you you wow. could compare that with 600 submarines that uh, Japan had built and over 1,100 uh, submarines deployed by Germany and. Uh, you see right away, you know, there's a great disparity in numbers here. So how could such a small force uh, have had any sort of impact mm. on uh, on our victory in World War II? And uh, so that's, w- that's what I wanted to explore. And, and so I don't think Nimitz was overstating the case when he said that uh, the tiny American submarine force held off the Japanese empire and, and bought time for our country to um, replace the losses uh, that we had incurred early in the year and, and really put the whole, um, you know, drive towards victory uh, made, made it possible because uh, you know, if it hadn't been for the submarines, um, we probably would have been more or less wiped out uh, in the Pacific and it would have taken even a greater effort than uh, than we expended to actually replace our losses and uh, come up with a number of, of ships and aircraft carriers and, and what have you that fought in the Pacific and and uh, made the victory possible. So okay. they they were they were very important to the overall victory. Yeah, and I, again, I didn't, I did not truly appreciate that until I read your book. So, so let's jump into it. So, Pearl Harbor comes along, like you said, our surface fleet is badly damaged. What state is the U.S. submarine fleet in the Pacific uh, at the time of Pearl Harbor? Well, um, there were at the time of Pearl Harbor twenty-two submarines in the American Pacific Fleet. Mm-hmm. That were normally based at Pearl. There were others at uh, in the Philippines and uh, 
a few others scattered uh, across that vast expanse of the Pacific. But uh, in at, at Pearl Harbor, there were only five that were actually in port when the Japanese hit on December 7th, mm. 1941. The others were either at sea or uh, back in the States. And uh, the five that were that were at Pearl Harbor weren't really seaworthy at that point. Uh, right. uh, most of them were undergoing maintenance, and um, so they didn't have their full crews aboard. They they could not have uh, have um, departed Pearl Harbor on December seventh. But uh, those who did have a partial crew um, sprang into action and and um, manned their uh, machine guns on deck and fired at the Japanese planes, and I think at least one Japanese plane was uh, shot down by gunfire from uh, the submarines at Pearl. But, uh, you know, it was it was one of those things where everybody at, at uh, Pearl Harbor was caught flat-footed right. and um, incapable of really putting up much resistance. Um, so it was, a, it was a very dark time for the... Uh, the U.S. Navy and, and, for that matter, the Army and the Marines and the Air Force uh, in the Pacific to really do much uh, to strike back immediately. It took, it took quite some time, many weeks, before um, we were able to send out uh, surface ships, and so the slack had to be taken up by the submarine force. And uh, they, were, they were really up against it. Uh, the Japanese had... Uh, Within the first week following the Pearl Harbor attack, had had really overwhelmed a lot of the garrisons in the Pacific and uh, were running uh, rampant uh, across the Pacific with very very few other countries able or willing to uh, put up much of a fight. Yeah. So one of the things, and I'm sure you know this better than I do, but one of the things that keeps surprising me, even though it shouldn't, as I'm reading about Pearl Harbor, you know, the news is getting back to the States and people are just having trouble believing it or, or the shock is just so overwhelming. But uh, it, it was just it's like, is this a drill? Is this a prank or whatever? But Admiral Harold R. Stark, chief of naval operations in D.C., didn't seem to have that problem. He, he uh, pretty much jumps into action and uh, releases his subs to just, I guess, just to go out there and to go after the Japanese mm -hmm. in, in whatever fashion they're able to. Yeah, there was a, um, what was called the London Naval Treaty of 1936. Mm. That was an international agreement um, that kind of um, various seagoing nations had, had signed uh, that restricted the use of submarines and of course the the germans you know they didn't care much about that and they had their whole u-boat fleet out there um since 1940 sinking uh ships in the atlantic and uh so uh admiral stark said well you know <laughs> the gloves come off we've got to <laughs> you know fight for our survival here and so uh told the department of the navy that um you know, from now on, uh, we're going to conduct unrestricted sub submarine warfare as well, and so uh, that gave the uh, the submarine force in the Pacific the uh, the green light to go ahead and do whatever was necessary to stop the the Japanese from using the Pacific as their own superhighway to reinforce their garrisons on islands that they had conquered and. Uh, do whatever was necessary to, to sink the Japanese uh, uh, ships wherever they were found. So, Unfortunately, we didn't have very many submarines uh, that could do that. And, and then there was another issue that uh, I bring up in the book about the unreliable torpedoes that uh, also uh, nearly uh, destroyed the American submarine force's ability to strike back at the Japanese yeah, I found that incredible. So like you said a minute ago, you've got this vast expanse that is the Pacific Ocean. You've only got a few submarines. And it turns out as they start engaging the Japanese because the gloves are off, they're finding that the very thing that they need to not win the war, but just to survive until the Americans can rebuild is defective. 
Could you tell us a yeah. little bit about that? And just the overall yeah, yeah. Be, stubbornness it, of the Navy. Go ahead. I'm sorry. Well, it, it would be, I, I suppose, comparable to um, issuing blank ammunition to your troops mm-hmm. um, because the torpedoes that were uh, issued to the submarines, not only were they very few in number, but... Um, those that the submarines did use uh, against the Japanese ships, um, you know, mostly uh, didn't work. Um, they would, they would uh, be fired from the to- the uh, torpedo tubes in the subs, and either they would detonate uh, partway to the target, or they would uh, hit the target and bounce off without uh, exploding, or they would run too deep and go underneath the hulls of the ships and. Uh, I think I think the the if we can have a culprit in this story, it would be Admiral Ralph Waldo Christie, who was commander of the U.S. submarine force in the Southwest Pacific. Um, he had been at the Bureau of Ordnance uh, in the Navy Department, sometimes called Buord, right. and they were, um, as the name implies, charged with uh, making sure that. Uh, the Navy got um, adequate amounts of uh, reliable ammunition or ordnance, and uh, he had been involved in in torpedo development before the war. And everybody kind of called him Mister Torpedo. Ah. And so when these reports uh, started coming into to his headquarters about uh, you know sighted ship fired torpedoes, uh, nothing happened. Um, he he, kind of like well, they 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 must not be, you know, well trained crews that are out there because I know these these torpedoes are are good. Oh, I was right. responsible for much of the torpedo development, and uh, so he was refusing to listen to criticism. And uh, and uh, even back in in Washington D.C., uh, the Navy Department was discounting these reports of defective t- um, torpedoes and uh, said, well, it must be the, the crews, uh, they're not uh. being trained properly or the commanders are are not brave enough and they're not getting in close enough to to the uh, targets and they're firing from too great a range. Because most of the torpedoes have a range of, of roughly five miles. And uh, so, you know, fingers were being pointed every which way but at the real problem. And it took over a year before Buord finally said, well, maybe we ought to run some tests and and see if, if what the submarine commanders are telling us is true. And, and uh, during that period of time, one of the um, naval officers uh, based in Australia was running his own tests and mm-hmm. And he was coming back with, uh, you know, pretty substantial data saying, yeah, it's a submarine, uh, it's the torpedoes, it's not the submarine crews or commanders uh, or the tactics. Uh, the torpedoes themselves are defective, and he was trying to come up with all sorts of solutions to figure it out. But one of the problems was that, that the torpedoes weren't always defective. Sometimes they would hit. Sometimes they would detonate uh, on on impact, um, and the enemy ships would be sunk. So how do you isolate a problem without being able to say, well, it happens all of the time or it happens 90% of the time? Maybe it was happening 60 or 70% of the time. Mm-hmm. But uh, it, was, it was quite a conundrum that the uh, submarine force was faced with. Uh, so... Yeah, it, it was it was very bad, and no doubt uh, meant that many Japanese ships sailed away to land troops or supplies on their island garrisons, and no doubt many Americans died because these uh, shipments were not interdicted. Right. So at the worst possible time, there's, and I guess, interdepartmental fighting going on because everybody's got their pride. Everybody wants to protect their own domain. But like you said, people are dying. And I was actually 
groaning out loud when I was reading these parts of the books about these subs. You know, they would get in, do their job, get in close, fire off numerous torpedoes, and just absolutely nothing would happen. Uh, you can certainly talk about some of those instances if you want to, but I guess what the other thing that shocked me was it actually gets worse for the submariners because not only are they having this random problem, but then they start running low on torpedoes, mm-hmm. which is incredible. Yeah, I mean, you know, what's what's worse than having defective torpedoes and not having any at all, or, <laughs> or you know, being restricted to instead of firing a spread of four torpedoes, well, you can only fire one because you you know you don't have a full complement of them on board. So, yeah, there were, there were many uh, stories that I recount in the book, and it's probably not you know even all of the the uh, malfunctions that took place. Um, mm-hmm. There were um, one of them, um, December 14th of, of 41, a submarine called a Sea Wolf um, snuck into a, a harbor on the east coast of Luzon in the Philippines and saw a bunch of Japanese ships there and fired eight torpedoes at them, and there were no explosions. Oh. Uh, and, of course, you know, if, if you're shooting... Uh, torpedoes or any other kind of munition at the enemy and they realize what you're doing, they're going to go after you. And Uh. so each submarine who had this happen uh, found themselves uh, on the receiving end of the enemy response that the Japanese destroyers would, you know, go out. They saw where the torpedo wakes were in in the water and uh, they would head out there and and they had... uh, radar and uh, sonar that they could use to locate underwater uh, objects like a 300 foot long submarine uh, and kind of circle around it and start dropping depth charges and and it's uh, you know caused a, a number of our submarines to be destroyed and the men in them uh, killed so it was uh, you know like I say in the book it was akin to whacking a hornet's nest with a stick that it uh, almost invariably uh, results in uh, a reaction by the target. And uh, and so submariners were, were getting a little gun-shy. You know, are, are we going to fire our torpedoes and have them malfunction and then have the enemy breathing down our necks and, and uh, going after us? Um, so it was a very difficult period that went on for months and and uh, over a year, and nobody nobody had the right answer to what was going on, why these uh, torpedoes were were malfunctioning to the extent that they did. So, yeah, that was that was a difficult time for them all. Here's a question for you: What would you do to save humanity, and how far would you go to stop someone? who was getting in your way. The ancient rivalry of assassins and Templars cuts to the heart of good versus evil. But it wasn't always clear who was good and who was evil. Plug in to explore the amazing world of medieval feuds. Echoes of History, Assassins versus Templars, is a special collaboration between History Hit and Ubisoft, the masterminds behind the Assassin's Creed games. Hosted by Dan Snow from History Hit and Matt Lewis from Gone Medieval, together they will take a close look at the real history of the secret societies, which inspired the Assassin's Brotherhood and the Templar Order in the Assassin's Creed games. Plus, they will bring on other premier historians as they discuss unearthing the myths of the Grail and who really was the inspiration for the main characters in the game. Echoes of History, Assassins vs. Templars podcast is available right now wherever you get your podcasts. Listen and subscribe to Echoes of History today to discover the hidden truths that have shaped our world and inspired the video game series. That's Echoes of History wherever you get your podcasts. Listen today and subscribe for more. One of the many things I got out of your book was just how brave and a little bit crazy these guys are. I mean, we are talking courage here. They're in this, you know, this tin can and uh, underwater and, and, um, 
But, I mean, they're going after the targets. They're doing everything they can. Suddenly the weapons sometimes work. They sometimes don't. And like you said, they get harassed. Um, but they, because the weapons do sometimes work, there is some successes that they're having. Uh, could you tell us a little bit about the Skipjack commanded by uh, Charles Freeman? Yeah, the Skipjack, um, they were on a, a patrol I forget now where exactly that happened, but uh, they were out at sea, and and usually they were just operating, you know, as a single boat. They did not have, mm. you know, a wolf pack like the Germans did uh, for most of their early patrols, and and so the skipjack is out on a patrol, and it sees a Japanese aircraft carrier, kind of like the choicest of targets, yeah. and of course, you know, the aircraft carriers were important for both. The Americans and uh, the Japanese in World War II. That's how the Japanese got close enough to Pearl Harbor uh, to um, attack uh, that facility. And, and so um, both sides w- were very eager to knock out the other side's aircraft carriers. And, mm-hmm. and so um, Captain Freeman closed in, got very close to the uh, aircraft carrier and fired off three torpedoes and uh, and none of them exploded. Oh, uh, they either went under the the, cra- the carrier or bounced off the hull. And uh, it was again just one of those very frustrating and dangerous things that was done. I I, I think I should also talk about the physical uh, condition of the submarines. Um, mm-hmm. In 1943, um, we had a new class of submarines that that came out called the Fleet Submarines and uh, the Baleo class. And uh, these were about 310 feet long. Uh, They had a beam of, I think, 28 feet and a crew of somewhere between 80 and 90 men. Um, The uh, conditions inside the submarine were just atrocious. The I don't think uh, they had air conditioning, uh, so the temperatures inside were well over 100 degrees. Oh uh, there was the only time you had fresh air was when you could surface and mm-hmm. open the hatches, and so when the hatches were closed, you had about an hour's worth of oxygen. Um, uh, the most of the sailors were smokers, so oh, the submarine is filled <laughs> with cigarette smoke. Right. Uh, you couldn't you couldn't usually take a shower while you're at sea, so you might be out for two, three, four weeks. So you've got eighty sweating <laughs> bodies in this enclosed right. metal tube. Um, you know the, the the I think there were two toilets on board for the enlisted men. The officers had one toilet that they shared. Uh, the enlisted men had had two, but the first half of the voyage. Only one was operational because um, the other one was used as a food storage uh, area. I mean, the uh, space on board yeah. a World War II submarine was at a premium. If you've ever been into, you know, a museum submarine, right. you get this, you know, feeling of extreme claustrophobia. And, and, uh, and there were special instructions that you had to follow in order to even flush the toilets. I mean, it was... <laughs> wow, you you didn't want to <laughs> you up. didn't want to get uh, covered with the effluvia <laughs> when the, you got the backflow came right. sloshing back out of the toilet and and you certainly didn't want to have the guy following you have to <laughs> face that uh, right. or you were persona non grata. <laughs> um, so the the conditions were were very difficult. Uh, I I just don't know how these guys and all of all of the submariners were were volunteers um and mm-hmm. so they they were all there because they wanted to be I, they, obviously they got hazardous duty pay and uh the, the pride that came from uh, wearing the the silver dolphin right. insignia that showed they were submariners uh, there's a, there's one story in the book that talks about uh when uh uh, one of the submarines was on shore leave, and the, and the uh, submariners had gotten all cleaned up and put on their clean uniforms, and and took t- they took their showers, and they were in at the base exchange, shopping, and there were some 
women who were obviously wives of other sailors at the base and the women just like, you know, their noses kind of crinkled up and <laughs> they right. turned around and made some nasty comments about the the smell of the submarine. <laughs> and, <laughs> but it, you know, it, it, it was a stench that never left you even after you had cleaned up. Wow. Um, so I mean, it, we get into this in, in the book about some of the conditions that uh, the submariners had to face. And that was, over and above, or you know, not even counting what would happen if if you were uh, undergoing a depth charge, where you the oh, the skipper yeah. would take the submarine down and and in many cases just put it on the on the seabed and uh, just just have to take the hammering that the uh, the submarine or the um, the destroyers up above were were giving to them um, in in some cases. Uh, a depth charging could take hours or even uh, a day or two, and uh, any one of which you know could burst the hull or create a some damage that could not be repaired. And there were many uh, submarines that did not return from from patrol and uh, are still on the bottom of the of the ocean somewhere in the Pacific. So, wow. submariner's life was uh, probably worse than any other um, combatant in the military. Uh, and you really have to take your hat off to these guys who uh, put up with those conditions and uh, performed as as well as they did under the circumstances. A- absolutely. Uh, I think you mentioned one, one part in your book, um, you know, early on just after Pearl Harbor. I can't remember those numbers, but a set number of subs go out then they come back and another set they go they go out again, but there's fewer of them. Then they come back in and refuel or whatever. Then they go out again, and there just seems to be fewer and fewer subs going out. Whether it's they're lost, they're damaged, uh, whatever's going on. So yeah, these guys are having a a heck of a time, um, and and they're going to have a hard time for like you said for at least a year because they've got to figure out all these problems. But obviously, yeah. a, a sub can be used for something other than just um, you know sneaking up on a vessel and shooting it. Um, I, they can also be used for fairing. Can you tell us about removing the uh, cryptanalysts? I'm probably saying that wrong. Cryptanalysts, okay. yeah. Um, in, in, um, in the Philippines, before it was overrun by the Japanese, mm-hmm. um, there was a body of Navy uh, personnel who had been cra- uh, trained in... Uh, breaking Japanese code. Mm. Um, we called it um, MAGIC. That was the kind of the uh, top secret cover name for our ability to do that. And this, right. just like in, in uh, the European theater when uh, the British uh, discovered how to break the, the German secret uh, codes and uh, know what the Germans were planning and, and everything, we were doing the same thing in the Pacific mm. with a similar uh, system called MAGIC. And uh, so we had a group of, of men uh, in the Philippines who were able to um, break the Japanese code and, and pass on to their superiors what the Japanese were planning. And obviously this is like having a, a spy in the enemy's huddle. Right. You, you know what play they're going to run before they run it. And so MacArthur and uh, Nimitz and other American uh, officials in the Pacific could try and uh, create some countermeasures to uh, to fight uh, fight off what the Japanese were going to do. Mm-hmm. And uh, as the Philippines were being overrun by the the Japanese and uh, the Americans in the Filipino army were being pushed into the Bataan Peninsula, which is to the west of Manila Bay and the city of Manila, mm-hmm. um, it became pretty obvious that the uh, cryptanalysts were in danger of being um, captured. And so uh, the decision was made to get those guys out of there and uh, take them to, to someplace uh, safer that wasn't in danger of being uh, overrun. And so um, 
the, and there were a couple of uh, submarines that uh, came in to uh, Corregidor Island to remove these cryptanalysts and uh, eventually take them down to Australia, where they continued doing their, their mm-hmm. work. Um, there was another incident where a group of Marine commandos called Carlson's Raiders were uh, picked up by submarine and um, taken to uh, wherever they were going to stage um, their their reigns. So, so there were about uh, 200 uh, men in uh, Carlson's Raiders that were that were taken uh, uh, out of. Uh, See where were they? Uh, I'm looking at the book right now, trying to sure. to find this. Uh, I think uh, they were probably taken uh, off of uh, the Philippines and taken to Macon Island to create a diversion uh, and uh, try and keep the enemy troops from uh, attacking the First Marine Division that had just landed on Guadalcanal. Um, uh-huh. So the, the 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 submarines did more than just sink. Um, the uh, enemy ships, they, they were also used to move small bodies of uh, troops from one location to another. And it was pretty effective, but, you know, you couldn't, you know, take 1,000 or 2,000 men. Right. It, it had to be a pretty, uh, pretty small uh, group of, of people that, uh, that, that were involved in that. Um, there was another interesting uh, story about uh, the Philippines uh, that the uh, Philippines, uh, before they were overrun by the Japanese, mm-hmm. were in you know wanting very much to have their their national um, treasury full of gold and, and silver uh, removed before the Japanese could get it. Right. And so uh, uh, it was decided that um, the uh, submarine, I think it was the Trout. Landed uh, at Corregidor, where the gold and silver had been taken from the treasury and uh, removed uh, from the Philippines. I think they had oh, uh, four, three hundred and some gold bars uh, that weighed six or six and a half tons, and right. and uh, over six hundred bags of silver coins. So the ballast on the submarine uh, was worth nearly ten million dollars. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the, and and the the gold and silver were brought back to the United States and uh, stored at Fort Knox, Kentucky. Right, and then after the war, their the national treasury was returned to the Philippines. So it's kind of one of those little <laughs> odd stories that pop up when you're doing research and you you come across uh, weird things like that. Yeah, the the picture in your book, you've got these sailors around with the officers. Everybody's watching everybody, obviously, but. Um, I, I know, I know that the sailors or whatever the proper the submariner is paid a certain amount of money for their uh, for the risk, and so. But just to be around that much money must have been. You know, some of these are farm boys or or locals or whatever from mm-hmm. Middle America, and it must have been just absolutely staggering staggering for them to be around it. But I very much enjoyed the picture of yeah. everybody watching everybody as the as the treasure was being brought on board. Yeah, I'm, I'm sure security was very tight that day. <laughs> And they probably had a very uh, detailed inventory of exactly. all of the gold and silver. Yep. yep. Um, and um, the president, the Philippine president, uh, obviously you, you can't leave him there to be uh, captured by the Japanese because that would be a huge propaganda uh, tool. So I guess he was brought off as well. Yeah, Manuel Quezon mm. was, was the president of uh, the Philippines at that time. And and he was um, taken away by a um, submarine called the Swordfish, and uh, and then also um, President Roosevelt uh, told uh, General MacArthur, who was you know the, the army uh, head in the Pacific area, that uh, he needed to get out of uh, the Philippines also, mm-hmm. and uh, and he was taken. Uh, part of the journey by by submarine from the Philippines to Australia, where he set up his uh, headquarters. So it was it was uh, yeah it was a difficult time and and uh, it was very uncertain as to who was going to win the war in the Pacific. 
it certainly didn't look like the Americans or the British or the Dutch or the Australians or anybody else uh, had the capability of, of stopping uh, the Japanese juggernaut. Right. Because like you say in the book, I mean, the the Japanese have hit Pearl Harbor, the Americans are licking their wounds, there's it's this giant area, there's only a few subs, and roughly half of their torpedoes don't work. And so the Japanese are spreading out all over, they're reinforcing these, these new positions that they're, that they're taking. The Americans... Because, and this is just a part of the American culture that I enjoyed in your book very much, you know, they're going to figure out a problem. So like you said, some of the commanders are holding tests, they're trying to figure out, and they're starting to figure out that, I think you said earlier that um, some of the torpedoes were actually traveling like 10 to 12 feet lower than what everyone, what they what they were aiming for. And so they're going right under the very vessels that they're supposed to hit, which, which is amazing. Um, but in April of 1942, the Asiatic submarine force is going to get a new commander. And he seems to be pretty pretty assertive, pretty aggressive, and, and like any good commander, he's going to fi- he's gonna look at the situation, look at his men, and try to figure out what the hell is going on. Yeah, this was uh, Rear Admiral Charles Lockwood, and uh, he was really the shot in the arm that the uh, submarine force needed. He, he mm. became uh, commander of the what they call the Asiatic Submarine Force, and uh, he was you know, obviously privy to all of these reports about malfunctioning uh, right. torpedoes, and he was really angry at Buord and at uh, Admiral Christie for not being more aggressive in terms of figuring out what the problem was. I mean, mm-hmm. the torpedoes at that time were costing about $10,000 a piece, which in today's dollars was maybe $100,000 each. And uh, you just, you know, it was a tremendous waste of money, Right. Uh, not to mention uh, putting the, the lives of the submariners in danger when they attacked with uh, no effect. Mm -hmm. And so um, Lockwood came in and said, well, you know, we're going to figure this thing out. And uh, he he presented some of his thoughts to Buord, and they didn't want to hear it. And uh, it was, uh, you know, so he he was fighting the Navy bureaucracy, trying to uh, get them to realize that it, it wasn't the crews, it wasn't the commanders, it was the, the torpedoes themselves. And uh, But, you know, it was still an unpredictable situation uh, even into April and May of 1942. Um, about this time, the, the Battle of the Coral Sea takes place early May of 42. Mm-hmm. Uh, the Coral Sea area is southeast of New Guinea, uh, Near the Solomon Islands, and uh, it was the uh, the first of six major sea battles that were solely fought by aircraft. The uh, right. surface ships never saw each other, so it was a a big carrier war. And um, the U.S. Uh, really took its its lumps. Uh, the Lexington, the carrier Lexington, was was sunk. The Yorktown was damaged. Mm. We lost sixty six uh, aircraft. Uh, uh, two destroyers were sunk, and um, the Japanese losses weren't quite as bad, but uh, we had four obsolescent boats. They were called S-boats. Uh, this was before the submarines started being named after uh, sea animals and fish. Right. Um, and so these four S-boats, also called sugar boats, because sugar was the... the uh, um, code word or code letter for the letter S. And um, they were sent out to um, intercept the Japanese fleet, but only one of them hit anything. Uh, But in spite of the poor performance of the submarines, uh, the Battle of the Coral Sea has been regarded as an American victory because uh, the Japanese were forced to retreat. Uh, Mm -hmm. They, they caused, it caused the uh, Japan to uh, postpone their planned invasion that, Port Moresby, New Guinea, and ultimately cancel their planned invasion of Australia. So, you know, even though we we took a lot of uh, 
a lot of damage and, and uh, lost a lot of men and ships and aircraft in the Battle of the Coral Sea. It did still, you know, end up being uh, a strategic victory, if not a tactical one, immediately. So, so we're taking our lumps during the Coral Sea, like you said, tactical victory. But and this is the part of the book where I'm literally biting my lip when you get to the Battle of Midway. And like you said, because we have magic, we mm-hmm. know what's going on. Nimitz is gathering his armada. The Japanese are gathering theirs. And because we know what's going on and we've got subs in the area that we could deploy, this should have been a major, um, um, what, what's, what's the word I'm looking at? This should have been a major black eye for the Japanese. If, you can, if they gather a whole bunch of their ships and we know about it, Obviously, one of the things you want mm-hmm. to do is send in your subs, wipe them out, but that's not what's going to happen. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Nimitz, uh, because we knew what the Japanese were going to do because of the, the magic decryptions, mm-hmm. um, he put together a fleet to, to counter the Japanese that he knew were on their way to Midway. And there was uh, probably more submarines in that one fight than anywhere else. We wow. had uh, something like 25 submarines uh, that were given the mission to find and attack the approaching Japanese invasion force. Mm-hmm. Um, but it uh, it didn't it didn't happen. Um, there were uh, a number of uh, of submarines who didn't even see the Japanese at all. They were in the wrong part of the ocean, um, and uh, I think I think uh, probably the the most telling story is is the story of the Nautilus, um, captain by uh, Lieutenant Commander William Brockman, mm-hmm. and uh, he was a pretty experienced uh, submariner, and uh, he had seen a uh, Japanese battleship and through cruisers coming coming on, uh, but uh, Japanese planes had spotted the Nautilus, and Brockman uh, submerged Mm -hmm. just in the nick of time. Uh, And uh, so a Japanese cruiser and two destroyers located the Nautilus and were just running over him with depth charges. And um, finally, uh, Brockman surfaces at least a periscope depth, and he kind of looks around and he sees just this, he's kind of like surrounded uh, 360 degrees by enemy ships. Right. And uh, he was uh, saying, you know, well, I got to do something about this. I got all these wonderful targets here. And so he he, uh, started launching torpedoes uh, at the Japanese ships and um, nothing happened. There were no hits uh, but again, the the Japanese spotted him and started depth charging him again. Uh, he came back up an hour or so later and uh, looked around, uh, saw a Japanese carrier that American uh, planes had uh, attacked and was lying dead in the water. Mm-hmm. And uh, but he then saw another carrier and went after it, but. Uh, uh, you know, he was just, uh, you know, surrounded by these, these targets, but uh, they, uh, he was unable to, to really um, uh, do anything about it. Right. Um, oh. they, they were firing all of their torpedoes, and uh, either they missed or they bounced off the, the hulls, and uh, it was just, uh, you know, one of those situations where he was just so frustrated <laughs> by the the whole thing that um, you know he he wrote some reports uh about the situation and again you know even though Lockwood said well you know you're right on uh, it's the it's the torpedoes that uh, are the problem but uh, B Ward said no no you must not be uh, doing something right and and uh, so it, the Japanese ships continued to escape. Uh, so Lockwood is is very frustrated about uh, the whole situation. He uh, runs another series of tests down in Australia where he has some uh, a submarine fire, some dummy rounds, and uh, comes up with the figure 11 feet on average that the torpedoes are going under the target. And uh, so he reports that uh, back to Buord, and they say, "Well, you know, we don't believe you." Right. 
and uh, Lockwood decides, well, I'll run the test. Maybe there was something wrong with my test. He brings in a, another submarine, they fire a few more test torpedoes, and he gets the same result. And uh, so he, he decides, well, you know, I'm not getting anywhere with Buord. And uh, he really puts his career on the line by going over Buord's head, and he contacts uh, Admiral Ernest King, the chief of naval operations back in Washington, and tells him, you know, what's been going on, and these are the tests I've run, and uh, um, Buord doesn't believe me, and I don't know where to go from here. So King says, well, you know, uh, obviously this is a situation that uh, can't stand, and uh, we've got to do something about it. So he ordered uh, Buord to conduct their own trials uh, in Rhode Island, and uh, that confirmed the, the fact that the, that the torpedoes were running too deeply, and uh, so now that they've figured out what the problem is, they can actually come up with a solution, which is what they, they start to do. But it would take a while right. uh, before the torpedo manufacturing uh, factories could turn out uh, uh, torpedoes with, uh, with the correct um, equipment that uh, would, would uh, counteract the deep running problem. Uh, so in the meantime, uh, the... Submarines uh, are have to, you know, they have to continue to to use the faulty stuff and keep their fingers crossed and and hope that uh, that they might hit something and it will explode when that happens. So, yeah. uh, but during the 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 test, uh, they also discover that uh, the magnetic exploder uh, on some of the torpedoes. There were two types of exploders: contact and magnetic. So mm-hmm. the the contact, as the name implies means that it would uh, detonate uh, as soon as it hit a hull, uh, and the magnetic exploder would uh, was supposed to detonate when it got within um, proximity of an iron hull, but uh, you know, with every uh, action there is an equal and opposite reaction, and so uh, ships had learned that uh, if you degauss a, a ship's metal hull, hull uh, you take away its magnetic field, and so mm. torpedoes with magnetic exploders uh, wouldn't work on those. So it'd be like you know trying to hit hit a wooden hulled ship with a magnetic <laughs> exploder. There's not enough uh, metal to to cause it to uh, detonate. So they're working on that as, as well as the deep running problem. Um, so it was, it was like you know a comedy of errors, except it wasn't very funny right. uh, for the submarine crews to to have to put up with this type of uh, situation. I just have to say real quick before we go on, I've read and biography several biographies of uh, Admiral Ernest King, and that man scared me. He was very intense. He was very intelligent, and he did not suffer fools lightly. So you're absolutely right. Lockwood did put his entire career on the line by jumping the chain of command. That's something King would normally not tolerate. But fortunately for him, in a way, I mean, he was accurate with the information that he was bringing to Admiral King. Yeah, and I, I don't think Lockwood would have done that had he not had faith in in the results of his tests. Mm. And, uh, you know, and, and all of the... The messages he was getting from his uh, submarine commanders saying, "You've got to do something about this, Charlie. It's not working." Yeah. And uh, I think you know, out of as a good commander should, he he took the welfare of his men uh, as his highest priority. And if he was losing submarines and men to the fact that the torpedoes were rotten, you know, he had to do something about it uh, to the point of risking his own naval career. Yeah. And and I'm kind of jumping ahead, but I just have to say this real quick. You mentioned earlier that the, the torpedoes are like $10,000 a piece. Obviously, you know, um, that's a lot of money. But in your book, you cover the story of a young man's training uh, to be a, a submariner. And yeah. obviously, the by the time he's ready to board to get aboard a sub and actually participate and help out. I mean, the United States government has spent a ton of money on him to get him into that, mm-hmm. to that point. So yeah, to lose these men over something like this, that no one's taking seriously or should try to fix that. That yeah. is just absolutely criminal. Well, um, it, it really was. And it was something that, uh, 
just you know couldn't be allowed to to go on as you said the a lot of time and money was invested in these submariners who were probably the best trained of any uh, warriors in World War II, even more so than than flight crews and pilots. Mm. Um, every man on a submarine had to know every other man's job. Wow! I mean that that's how intensive uh, their training was. And and not only did you have to have the smarts to be able to. Uh, you know, know what every gauge and dial and line and you know switch on a submarine was for, and what it controlled and what mm. it did. Um, you also had to be able to stand the claustrophobic confines right. of that submarine, and uh, uh, to be able to you know go through a, a depth charge <clears throat> that might last an hour or a day. And not crack up, and a lot of guys did crack up. You know, no matter how well trained you were, yeah. uh, there are certain things that you know the, the human uh, body and brain cannot be trained to withstand. Uh, I've always thought that you know, to to show a um, uh, an infantryman what it was like to be in uh, an artillery barrage, be on the receiving end, you had to put them out in the field uh, during basic training. Mm-hmm. And actually do that. Well, they never did that, you know. Right. I think probably because the trainees would have cracked up and said, "I think I'd rather be, uh, <laughs> you know, in the submarines where right. it's safer." Um, so you you couldn't really subject submariners to the type of conditions that they were going to face when they were actually in combat. So it was just you know an, an incredible group of men who. Who risked their lives every time they were out on a on a war patrol um, to accomplish their mission, and and they weren't being given the tools, i.e., operable torpedoes to uh, accomplish that mission. Yeah. So yeah. E- even though we're up to September of '42 in your book, I mean, not, it's it's still a struggle. Like you said, you never know if the torpedo is going to work or not. Yeah, they're starting to work on it, but it's going to take time to get the new and improved torpedoes out to the men. So they're doing the best they can. So, and as mm-hmm. and as no entity is perfect, um, I was I was jarred. I think is the only word by the story of uh Clack Ring's guardfish sub in September of 42. Could you tell us about that yeah. please? Yeah, this there aren't a lot of funny stories that come out of right. World War II submarine force, but but this one was kind of humorous. Um Thomas Clack Ring uh as you mentioned was the commander of a submarine called the Guardfish. Mm. And uh they were on um I, I think it was their first war patrol, and they were off the uh, northeast coast of Honshu, um, one of the Japanese home islands. Right. And they had uh, already uh, sunk um, several uh, Japanese ships, and uh, and they traveled into uh, a, a bay along the coast. And <laughs> there was a news conference that uh, Clackring held for the uh, American press, the correspondents, uh, to talk about this uh, this patrol that they had done and, and where they had sunk, uh, I think it was six ships. Mm-hmm. And uh, during the, the, the news conference, uh, Clackring's executive officer, Herman Kostler, um, said that uh, while they were along the coast that uh, he looked through the periscope and he spotted a passenger train that was traveling along the coast. Mm-hmm. And then seeing a uh, notation on the sub's chart of that part of Japan that a racetrack was nearby, um, <laughs> somebody had had put two and two together and said that, uh, well, the, the people on the train were probably going to the horse races. Right. And uh, Clackring uh, mentions uh, during the, the uh, press conference... Uh, kind of as a joke that uh, the officers had a close-up view of the horse races and began <laughs> betting on the horses. <laughs> and Kostler, his exec, says, I could have killed him for that. Right. But what the, what the hell, we had a great patrol. He was entitled to spin a sea story if he wanted to. Right. And it was a good story and, and good for morale back home. And so this story about uh, betting on horse races goes out on all the newswires, and it's printed in... Uh, 
in newspapers across the country. Uh, and uh, so the, <laughs> the guardfish had uh, gotten a reputation as, as a submarine that had sailed into Tokyo Bay and gotten close enough for its officers to wager on the ponies. And uh, later at the Pimlico racetrack, a clackering day was held, and and clackering was even made an honorary member of the New York State Racing Commission. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, funny things do happen in otherwise uh, grim circumstances. Yeah. Be- before we go on, I have to say personally, for me, the funniest part of the entire book was when you, uh, you were writing about um, – the threat to the Western coast, uh, you know, West coast of, uh, United States. And, uh, there were, I think like 10 submarine, 10 Japanese submarines, you know, operating yeah. off the coast. But for me, the funniest thing was in case the Japanese did any flyovers, cause obviously we're scared, we're paranoid. We feel, we feel defenseless, but in case there was any, um, flyovers of the West coast by Japanese bombers or whatever, on top of the building of Warner brothers, they had a sign. Could you could you tell us about that? Yeah, yeah. Please. Well, in uh, on the West Coast, um, and if you've ever seen the movie 1941 by Steven Spielberg, mm-hmm. uh, it is it it it's a, a wonderful recreation and a, a comedic one of the panic in Los Angeles during the early days of of uh, World War Two. So, right. you know, make sure you see that if you haven't already. Anyway. Um, there were a number of uh, aircraft manufacturing plants uh, that were on the west coast and uh, the um, the Lockheed plant happened to be next door to Warner Brothers and uh, Lockheed hired um, a bunch of artists and and uh, set designers to create a camouflage covering for their their buildings mm-hmm. this huge factory complex and so from the air, it looked like just, you know, part of Los Angeles. There were streets, there were houses, there were, oh. there were trees. Uh, and so unless you, you know, really looked very hard and had a really good aerial camera, you wouldn't be able to tell where the Lockwood, uh, Lockheed factory was. So before Lockheed did that, however, um, the neighboring, um, Warner Brothers Film Studio also looked like uh, uh, a factory from the air with all of the huge sound stages. Mm-hmm. And uh, they didn't want to get bombed in case the, the Japanese decided to attack L.A. And, and knock out the manufacturing plant. So on their roof, they painted Lockheed that away and had an arrow pointing towards the Lockheed no. plant. <laughs> and... To, to pay them back, uh, Lockheed painted on their roof Warner Brothers that away with an arrow pointing at Warner Brothers. But then, like I said, they, they put up this uh, marvelous uh, uh, camouflage uh, city that went on top of their buildings. And, and you can Google that. You can look it up, you know, Lockheed camouflage World War II. Right. And uh, there's some wonderful pictures of that. But, but that is a, another humorous um, aspect of, of things that were going on during a very uh, during a very serious time. Right. Um, yeah, and again, uh, even though we're getting later into 42, I mean, th- like you said, the uh, the guardfish had some successes, but there's still some battles that are not going to go uh, the Americans' way. Um, the, clearly, the tide of war hasn't really changed over yet, and the United States is still losing some of its fr- some of its capital ships. I mean, this is not this is still very uh, an ugly situation for the Americans. Yeah. Yeah. Um, mm-hmm. probably, you know, the, it's been described as the worst defeat ever inflicted upon the U.S. Navy at sea it took place during the Battle of Savo Islands, and, mm-hmm. and this is in the Guadalcanal area, and, um, so it was a situation where the, uh, Americans, um, ran into a fleet of Japanese. They were using an area called the slot mm-hmm. between a, uh, you might picture it as two lines of islands with a, about a 20-mile gap in between them, and, the, and they run parallel to each other. And so the, the Japanese are trying to um, reinforce their garrison. 
on Guadalcanal. Uh, the Marines have um, invaded the island, and, and they're fighting the Japanese ground troops there. And Japan is trying to um, resupply their men on, on Guadalcanal. And uh, so one, one night um, in uh, August, August 7th of uh, 1942, uh, the Japanese run a large convoy of, of ships down the slot and... Uh, the American uh, Navy and uh, the Navy aviators, uh, you know, take it upon themselves to to try and uh, um, stop this uh, this convoy called the the Tokyo Express. Right. Uh, and uh, in a in a span of about a half an hour, almost the entire American fleet was uh, nearly destroyed. Uh, Four heavy cruisers, um, American and Australian, were sunk. A, mm-hmm. a heavy cruiser and a destroyer were damaged. Um, it was just a, a, I guess you could call it a, a great victory on the, the part of the Japanese right. because there were no Japanese vessels that were lost during what's called the Battle of Savo Island. Mm-hmm. And so, um, you know, things are not going well for the Americans, even though it's August of 42, and um, we desperately needed, you know, more submarines and more submarines with with uh, uh, torpedoes that actually worked when they hit their, their target. So um, that was kind of the low point, I would say, in, right. in the Pacific uh, campaign, and uh, it, it could only get better from there. Right. So you're absolutely right. Even though it's later in 42, even though the Americans know what's going on with their their torpedoes, and even though they had to get Admiral King involved, it's still going to take time. These guys are going to have to to do the best they can until there's more subs out there, until there's more trained sub submariners out there, until they have better torpedoes. So they're just holding on. And, and like you said earlier, there are some successes, but they are still going to... Uh, to, to suffer through when when they do fire a, uh, a torpedo, it doesn't work, and suddenly they're going to be um, they're going to be attacked by the Japanese. But as 1942 ends, then 1943 opens up. The sub force is going to get some fresh blood. There's going to be some new leadership in there. Uh, can you tell us about that change? Yeah, and and it came about in kind of a tragic way mm-hmm. that um, the head of Com Sub Pack, um, the commander of submarines in the Pacific was a an admiral named uh, Robert English mm-hmm. and um, I, I think uh, you know he was he was pretty competent uh, right. uh, officer and uh, but he was heading back from Pearl Harbor flying into San Francisco and this was the uh, 20th of January 43 mm-hmm. and uh, along with uh, several of his staff officers and and their uh, goal was to uh, go to fly into San Francisco and, and head to the submarine base at Mare Island and, and see how construction of new submarines was coming along and how the repair of uh, damaged submarines was mm. uh, was progressing. And so that was the reason for his, his trip. Um, unfortunately, as they got close to the California coast, the uh, there was a big winter storm that came in and the, the pilot lost his bearing and the radio communications aboard the, the plane also failed. And uh, by the time the uh, situation was, was corrected, uh, it was discovered that the, the plane was over 100 miles north of San Francisco. Mm. And um, the, the storm was still going on. There was uh, a heavy fog bank and everything, and the, the pilot was basically lost and crashed into a mountain oh. east of Ukiah, California, and it, it took 10 days before the plane was was even discovered, and uh, English and, and 18 other people on board had, uh, had died in the crash. Mm. And uh, it was decided that... Uh, by Admiral King, Chief of Naval Operations, that uh, the successor uh, to English would be uh, Charles Lockwood, who was, you know, the real champion of of the submarine force. Mm-hmm. And uh, 
you know, he was the guy who went to bat, made sure that uh, the Navy realized the seriousness of the, the problem with the torpedoes. And so Charlie Lockwood takes over his comm sub pack, and uh, almost immediately things begin improving. Uh, the tactics uh, change um, to give an advantage to the submarines. The, the better torpedoes start arriving at their submarine bases, and new submarines start coming off the assembly lines and and bolstering the Pacific submarine force. So from then on until the end of the war, all all sorts of good things happened uh, for the submariners in the Pacific. All right. I, I don't think until I read your book, I don't think I really appreciated how much of a very dark year 1942 must have been for the Americans, certainly along the West Coast. I mean, the fear... Yeah of maybe maybe irrational who knows it doesn't matter but the absolute fear of a japanese invasion you know they're struggling and and i'm i'm assuming the american public didn't know the horrors that the submarine crews were going through yeah of course uh you know in wartime especially world war ii not so much anymore right um it wasn't uh, considered uh smart to let the enemy know what mm. problems you were facing or right. what defeats you were having, and, um, you know, to keep up morale at home, uh, you had to paint a cheery picture of right. victories and, uh, you know, the, the whole war situation. And, of course, the other side was doing it as well. You know, mm-hmm. Japanese were telling their citizens everything was, was good, and the Germans were telling German citizens that uh, all, was, all was fine, right. uh, just like we were telling our citizens that... Uh, you know, never been better. Right. Uh, but the reality was was uh, a very closely guarded secret. Uh, news releases were heavily censored, and uh, press conferences were carefully managed so that um, the enemy didn't, you know, get a true picture of what the situation was. And so, you know, uh, we have to say the same was was happening in terms of the problems with uh, the torpedoes and uh, and that was kept top secret until after the war was over we you know the last thing you want to do is tell your uh, opponent what your weaknesses are because they're going to exploit them and uh, and that's exactly what would have happened and and what did happen on those occasions when uh, when those weaknesses were revealed by whatever side uh, uh, revealed them Incredible, yeah. yeah. So, Mr. Whitlock, again, thank you for your time. Thank you for this book. Um, and, and for the listeners out there, we haven't even covered 50% of the book, because like the title suggests, it goes to 1945. Uh, and I truly did enjoy the story of John Ronald Smith. It, it talks about this very young guy, 15, 16 years old, whatever he was, that he, you know, he hears about Pearl Harbor and all the steps that he has to go through just to become you know, a submariner. So again, that was incredible. But I don't think until I read your book, truly how I I don't think I appreciated how absolutely dangerous it was to work aboard a sub, even given the information that you've given me so far on this interview, there was obviously uh, even more involved into it. But just the number of losses that these Mm -hmm. men went through during Mm -hmm. World War Two. Well, there, there was no finer, braver group of of men than uh, the, the submariners in the American submarine force. Uh, they were just uh, an amazing bunch of guys. I, I had the privilege of knowing uh, and interviewing many of them for the book, uh, which I'll, I'll just repeat for your audience. is sure. called The Depths of Courage, American Submariners at War with Japan, 1941 to 1945. And, um, Hopefully this uh, interview will uh, encourage a few people to to find out the whole story that's uh, been told in the book. And, and I thank you, Ray, for your interest in the subject and for our interview here today. Absolutely. And I certainly appreciate you talking to me, taking some time of the day after Christmas, uh, Mr. Woodlock. So again, I encourage everybody to check out that book. And hey, I'm going to go through your other books and we might be talking again, but I certainly do appreciate your time today. Uh, I look forward to that. And, and you and your listeners have a very happy 
New Year. Thank you, sir.